Here we go, our side chatters, drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke, and feeling fly like a G6 from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, and we know damn well that the false reality we inhabit, filled with stocks, bonds, legal names, and legal tender, is nothing more than an elaborate array of smoke and mirrors designed to hide the simple fact that we live in a system of indentured servitude, economic slavery, and consciousness control. And it's up to us as individuals to educate ourselves on our situation and work to reclaim that sovereignty of both mind and body. Well, to help us do just that today, we have an amazing guest, Santo Bonacci, who's been doing great work giving people the tools and education they need to walk the path of realization and ascension. A leader in the truth movement, a scholar and a gentleman. Santo, my man, how are you doing? Yeah, thanks, brother. Yourself? Uh, Yeah, better every day, man. It is a real pleasure to talk to you again. It's been a wild, wild couple years for both of us, really. But you have not only been a high profile example of the sovereignty reclamation path, you've also given some really insightful lectures on the true nature of reality and the universe, which is probably a good place to start. I've heard you say that before you can think about reclaiming your sovereignty, you have to be aware of how the universe works. How are these things linked? What do you think we need to know? Yeah, good question. Well, um, I suppose uh, I'll sum up my angle um, with one word, and that is syncretism. Mm. Syncretism is what we're going to be speaking about today. What what I was had in mind was to speak about um, – your question is actually uh, very, very appropriate because it's exactly what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the ascension process, what it is and what it isn't. Um, atomic language, and then end up with um, the uh, other subject you mentioned, sovereignty and hence law and um, Babylon the Great and how we go in and how we get out. So, But I would like to start with um, the syncretism part of it. Sure, sure. Yeah, because we'll do that first. Uh, get the spiritual side, uh, you know, so hence the priest is what I call the spiritual priest, and then the sovereign king, sovereignty and law and all the other part and how they marry together, and the atomic language, which um, is the universal language that we have. We do have one language, and it's it's atomic, basically. It's um, uh, language is produced by light, by um, letters okay. and... Um, and that is that's luminescence. It's a product of light, and sound is a product of light. So I'm going to show how that is. And so that light will merge the two. It will marry the two. The the spiritual, the priest and the king, the king and the priest that will rule with Christ for a thousand years. That's the motif of, you know, spiritual documents uh, all throughout this planet. They all speak about this age when um, the soul will be illumined, and um, and everyone will have what's called the Holy Spirit poured. Upon them, and they will, um, you know, they will know things that they didn't once know. You know, knowledge that was lost, and the holy scriptures, all of them, actually recount this wisdom. You know, uh, my favourite book would be the um, the Hebrew and Christian uh, Greek scriptures. You know, the Holy Bible. I mean, I love uh, that particular work. Mm. It's uh, excellent. It exceeds even itself when you realise how many levels of literary wisdom are packed into such a small book. But that doesn't take anything. Away Away from the Bhagavad Gita or Virgil's Ennead or anything of those um, those greats, they all speak of this beautiful science of syncretism. Syncretism is the science of uniting all things in one in one principle, or to find the 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 one principle in all things, whether that principle is beauty, the good, whether it is the principle of truth, the principle of being. Mm-hmm. We all um, intuitively. Uh, understand that there is a cause and effect and there is a cause to this beautiful effect that we live in, this world, this electrical world of vibrating atoms. And scientists will tell you that it is um, empty, really, um, you know, made up of empty spaces. So right. the Egyptians said that all is atum and then over in the east they said all is om. Well, atom, om, amen, amun, aton, 
Adonai, Dennis, Adonis, Dionysus, all of these atomic gods and words are our language. And so this um, atomic language is, is the language of, of light. And so what we learn is that we are here to basically experience, learn, remember. These words are key to our um, experience here. And um, so we know that there is a cause, and that cause seems to be spiritual. Hmm. So your philosophers and your mystics have always reminded us that reality is spiritual, and the physical world is an effect, it's an illusion, maya. And it's, it is, it's also, well, it's also like uh, Einstein said, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. It's, it is persistent, which gives us the, the sense that it is, it is truly reality, but it's not. It's being projected from a cause. And that cause in our solar system is the sun. Mm. That's interesting. I've heard you actually agree with or agree with aspects of what Eric Dollard is saying about the sun. Apparently, it's very different than what we're taught in school. Absolutely. Eric Dollard is right on the money, um, and he agrees with uh, Paracelsus and all the mystics and all the greats who have ever said that uh, the sun is free. It's a trinity. Yes, it is solo, sol invictus, the soul of the solar system. Our solar system is not really it's well it's it's a cell. We live in a solar cell. We live in a sphere rather than on a sphere. But Sol Invictus, the one who is alone in the sky on the ecliptic right ascending, he is three. He is also a trinity. It's what you're looking at is a spiritual source, as Eric Dollard calls it, primary power or primary force, converting into secondary force, and that's electricity. The primary force is the standing wave. It's, it's, well, it's, it's a magnetic white light. Electricity is red and blue light. So electricity is vibratory. It vibrates. It radiates. Hence, um, the luminescence it produces, which is the world of effects, um, it it's vibrates. And the poles of the vibration are the colors red and blue. And you get all the other colors of the rainbow spectrum in between. So in your chakra system, when you look at the colors of the seven chakras of your body, you see blue is at the throat, the top of the torso. Red is at the um, between the anus aperture and the uh, testes in a man. Um, that would be the, um, the red moon chakra. That's red. So you, you see the, the torso is polarized there. Then in the head, you have two uh, purpley indigo and violet and what what violet represents is the highest vibratory color that the human eye can see then it goes off into invisible which we call ultraviolet whereas infrared at the bottom of the torso all the chakras going down below from the bottom of the torso are brown and murky and this is hell you see so your bottom chakra is uh, sodom the second one is Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom is where sodomy happens, you see. So that's where the fire and sulfur and all of the brimstone and hellish stuff happens in the red colors. Then the heart chakra is green, which represents the, um, the earth, the planet that we uh, live in, which is the middle kingdom, the mid garden, middle garden or mid guard in Scandinavian law. And then, of course, when you look up from the earth, the heart chakra, you see a blue sky. Well, that's the blue chakra. So this is syncretism, what you're getting. And Mm -hmm. so the electrical world of effects are produced by suns. And our sun is threefold. It is spirit, soul, and body. We can physically see the body of the soul. It gives us warmth. But as Paracelsus said, the psychic nature of the sun, the mental and emotional and sensual, which is what you call the soul, hence soul invictus, which is the firstborn of God, which is the spiritual part of the sun. So you see, the firstborn is the soul. Mm -hmm. It is born and has a beginning but has no end, immortal. And so this is, this is what we get in the sun. The sun is all the Messiah heroes, Jesus, Allah, um, Buddha. It's 
all of the heroes, all of them are one. They all end up in one monad, one unity, and one totality. And that is the first principle of all things, which is being. Okay? So from being, you have all the principles and archetypes and prototypes. You have love. You have light. Two kinds of light. You have lux and lumen. Lux is divine light which is still white, non-vibratory light, which is motion in suspense. When motion in suspense decides to become motion in action, then electricity, the firstborn, soul invictus occurs. So we are living in the physical cell of the sun we call the solar system. We are also living in the psychic body of the sun, which is mental and emotional. And hence we have an, a mental body and an emotional body. Through the mental body we learn, through the emotional body we experience. And together we gather a harvest of um, information and knowledge and wisdom. And we go through the seven levels of consciousness, starting from the bottom seventh red chakra level of um, you know survival and, and all of those things. We rise from that level. That level is the level of opinion. That's man in his opinionated ways. And then we uh, arrive at um, illumination, which is the seventh level, the crown chakra. And um, this is when we truly, truly merge with the universal one. And um, this chakra has a secret name, which is Allah. A double L, and basically it's Allah because um, it, what it teaches when you get this illumination is that all is good, or Allah is God, which is the same meaning, the same expression. And so the chakras' names of these, starting from the bottom Lam, Vam, Ram, Yam, Ham, Om, Om is your third eye where your Indians put their bindi. And then the crown chakra has the name really of no name. There's no name, but they do give it the A double L, the all. Hmm. And so as we go through these seven levels of consciousness, both mentally and emotionally, we start with opinion. Okay. And then we um, grow out of that through the level of sense. And this is where we get all these words like sensible, common sense. Uh, senator, senior, a senior citizen uh, in Japan, a sensei. He is one who has his full senses and able to teach. This is syncretism, by the way. There's one language, and this is how um, you are able to uh, find syllables and um, find their words in all languages. And I've, I'm doing that currently in all my presentations, and I'm about to release 22 PowerPoint presentations, the first of which will be called Atomic Theology and Atomic Language, followed by 21 more. The number 22 is very significant. And um, these are all massive, massive research, packed with research presentations, which I will be releasing um, in um, the signs of cancer and leo hopefully <laughs> this year mm -hmm. so um when one uh, acquires this sense then they enter the level the third level of knowledge the door of knowledge um, must be open to those who are seeking the knowledge to uh, aspire to wisdom which is the next level but this wisdom is kind of um it's an, an understanding kind of wisdom because with knowledge you then understand things you see mm -hmm. and um, and then you acquire a wisdom that is intuitive that's the next level uh, so understanding then wisdom then what your neoplatonists like Iamblichus and, and uh, Porphyry spoke about the sixth level is theurgy which would be likened to a kind of um, Eastern yoga where one merges their um, their intuition with theos, with the God mind, and this is the third eye that sees, you see. Mm -hmm. the, the two eyes give us the refracted red and blue polarity, which Pythagoras called uh, duality in unity. Whereas the mind, the mind's eye, the optic thalamus, and um, all of that third ventricle, pituitary body, and pineal gland, and um, 
hypothalamus and all of that um, stuff there that sees more or less in unity. This is theurgy. And theurgy is basically the Western type of um, uh, the philosopher, hence the wise man, because philosophy means to be a philos of Sophia, a lover of wisdom. And so the, the lover of wisdom then goes to the next level, which is the mystic. And so this is what I'm doing today. I'm basically um, correcting what ascension is and what it isn't. Ascension is basically something that happens to all of us. We all become, we go through opinions and we, be, uh, we go then to through sense and that's your church stage when you're going to church and, <laughs> you know, when you're baptized in the water baptism and uh, that's where they start teach you, teaching you literalisms that the scriptures are literal rather than literary. You see, they don't teach that, uh, as the Apostle Paul taught, the letter of the word um, it kills, but the spirit of the word is what vivifies. Right. And so they are feeding on the milk of the Christ. The Christ is the top chakra. Or the Christ is the spiritual son, as Eric Dollard would put it, the, um, the, the power, you know, that is converted into soul force or mental force, which uh, produces this world of effects. And so, um, so we live in the psychic sun part of the sun too. We don't just live in the, the physical part of the elements that the earth has given us, this cloak called the body. Mm-hmm. And, and so we are also living in the mind of the demiurgos, the creator. So the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all one thing. It's the sun in the sky. Okay. That's really interesting, man. I'm kind of curious because I would say that I don't have necessarily a strong spirituality. I think I'm stuck kind of in an intellectual mindset. And um, I'm just kind of curious, what are some good introductory practices for people who seem to get these things intellectually, but really aren't feeling them energetically or having a hard time getting started with the process of ascension? All right, well, that's, that's going to happen naturally. The philosopher, which you are right now, and that deals with all a, a very broad spectrum of the intellectual and emotional mind growing and evolving. And as you, as you go, you will enter the higher levels. You will um, naturally um, be absorbed into them. That's your nature. Okay. It's the stairway to heaven. It's uh, the transmuting of lead into gold. But what must happen is, as happened in Pentecost, the torch or the tongues of fire must be... Um, the mystic must uh, come from the philosopher. So you will go from the intellectual stage, which is your Aristotle's and many of the philosophers, to the mystic, which will be, you know, your Plato's, your Pythagoras's, and all your Neoplatonists, five of which I would say were the greatest of all the mystics that taught theurgy, and that would be Plotinus, Proclus, Iamblichus, Porphyry, the greatest of all, and uh, Sallustius. And I would really recommend that we go back to our roots and to these, um, you know, to these great philosophical schools. The Neoplatonic school, of course, was the most. Um, they had a very profound penetration of integrity and uh, depth of uh, mystical wisdom. And so, what you will do, Greg, is you will naturally merge your, you will marry your intellectual. Um, mental mind and relinquish it one day for the higher mind of illumination and the mystic mystical mind and they will happen naturally as you go through these um these stages of ascension and i will um speak about you know the process of meditation chanting and theogens and all of these um aids necessary aids and diet the changing of your diet and various practices that will help you. Chanting is very, very important. There are seven vowels. Everything in creation is sevenfold, a septenary or an octave. That is physical creation complete. The universe was created in seven days. And the mental forces are 12. So you've got seven vowels and 12 consonants. Um, And these in... um, in Kabbalah, together with the three diphthongs, make the 22 paths or the 22 cards of the tarot deck. 
and um, basically they complete creation, the marriage of mind and matter, 12 and 7. If you look at the flower of life, you will see that seven circles are in the middle and 12 circles are on the outside and they make 19 altogether. And this is the, um, the magical number. So, but let's go back to seven. There are seven vowels. Sure. This is the thing. The two lost vowels are the secret ones which make up the name of God, which should be chanted and will help you in your ascension. The first vowel is the letter A. And the last one is the letter U, A-E-I-O-U. These are not vowels. These are diphthongs in English because it's not phonetic. In order to say the vowels properly, the five vowels that we know, we should be saying them phonetically as, as this, A, E, I, O, U, just one sound. Whereas in English, we're taught to say A, E, I, O, U. Well, that's, those are um, syllables. They are diphthongs, I should say, um, and so, correctly, the first letter, these are the seven vowels, and this is the true name of the Elohim or the true lost name of God that the Masons, you know, keep secret from you. Right. And, and this is how they are. I'll say them first. I actually know I'll tell you what, the, what they are first so that anyone who has pen and paper can write them down, and then mentally they will remember these better. The first is the capital, capital letter A. Then the letter E, which is the fifth letter, the second vowel, the second letter has a grave accent above it. The third E, the third letter E, has an acute accent above it. The fourth letter is I, the ninth letter of the English alphabet. Then you've got... Um, O with a grave accent above it, then O with an acute accent above it, and then finally U. And this is how they are pronounced. A, A, E, I, O, O, U. And together they give you um, The Hindus, they shorten it to A, U, M, or A, O, M. And they chant it. Om Namah Shivaya. But what they're doing is they're compressing those seven vowels, and that's this is how it's done. A a e i o o u become a om. And it's like merging the two words in English, a, as in a. How you going, mate? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um. Oh, as in exclamation. Oh, that's not very good, is it? So, A and O, oh, and you got A O oh, M. Um. That is the, uh, those are the seven vowels. Now, I'll just make a note that A, the first A, letter A, is pronounced as in A above. Above, the word above. Okay? The E, that's like um, at. All right, or and. So you've got a and a, above and at. Then the next, the e with um, the um, the um, acute accent above it. That's e, okay, as in um, etymology. Okay. Then the i, the i is i, as in inside. These are, this is just for people, uh, the listeners making notes, because this is very important that they get the true pronunciation of these seven sacred vowels. And I learned this from James Morgan Price in his book on Revelation, the book of Revelation. And, um, and uh, he explains that when St. John gets the vision from um, the Lord, um, he sees a, a God as a sevenfold creature, you know, one who has um, a sword, emanating from his mouth and he has wings on his feet and he has a, a copper belt around his breast uh, like a, um, you know, Aphrodite's belt and et cetera, et cetera. He actually explains, he actually describes the seven orbs of the solar system, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the sun, Venus, Mercury and the moon. And he gives the, the vowels and um, their true pronunciation, only I have to correct that he puts the, um, 
the O at the end for um, for this, but I put the U in. It's more appropriate to have a U at the very end. And so um, if you were to chant the Om, or you could even chant the 16-word um, Hare Krishna chant, which is one of the... Um, the most uh, electrifying chants you could possibly chant, and the 16 words are these. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And those 16 words, if you did that 16 times every day, you will find that you will, your consciousness will ascend hmm. to the top level and, and, you know, your crown chakra, you will notice that things will start to go inwardly for you and you will start to remember the truths, that the eternal truths which are there waiting for you when you give them that time, you know, when you, when you meditate, when you pause from daily living and go within. And then this chanting, the food that you uh, ingest also helps as you go from a um, meat-based diet, for instance, to a vegetarian diet, all the philosophers, Porphyry, Ovid, Pythagoras, Plutarch, uh, all of them, all the, mystic, the philosophers that became mystics um, left the, uh, the taste of blood behind. <laughs> That's going to be tough for me. I mean, I obviously know a lot of bad stuff is going on with the corporate factory farming and it's creating a lot of negativity, but that would be a, a tough challenge for me to convert from a meat-based diet. Yeah, yeah, because if you're, if you're um, still uh, eating meat, it's because you need to eat meat because we do not live on forms. We live on the etheric energy of the form, whether it be a vegetable or whether it be meat. So when you eat a steak, you're eating the, um, the bull energy and you are getting strengthened by that etheric. You see, the, the, the form, the substance is the, the amount you put into your mouth comes out the back end uh, quite the same um, volume. Mm -hmm. It's the actual, it's the etheric vibration that you are eating. And since we live in uh, four worlds, the solid, the liquid, the gas and the plasma, and we partake of the mental, emotional, vital and etheric bodies, um, we can only exist in four bodies at a time as we go through that solid state of, of uh, living. And the bottom earthly bodily level, which makes you, causes you to incarnate, that focal po pole of that incarnatory uh, energy is blood. And that's why um, the scriptures say you, you verse the blood of the uh, animal that you eat back to the ground you do not eat the blood the soul is in the blood and so when you 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 know when you eat a steak there's particles of blood that you're eating and you're eating the um the soul of the cow so the elite have known for many years that um you know circe will turn you back into um you know a physical body as uh ulysses men were turned into swine for instance right because and this is why they give you um, all the animals of the zodiac and more to um, to feast on. Uh, for instance, a cow will turn you into chattel, and they know that, and they've corporatized your chattel name. The eating lamb will make you good little sheeple, docile, and uh, they pull the wool over your eyes and uh, lead you to the slaughter like lambs and fleece you. Rabbits will make you um, run like a rabbit. Chickens will make you have a chicken heart. Pork will turn you into swine. And goat will make you a sacrificial goat and you will go off to war and we will make the uniforms, off you go, Christian soldiers, off you go to war. We will make the uniforms as we've done before. <laughs> so as the great uh, Reverend um, Robert Taylor in the early 1800s uh, exposed that the Freemasonic system we live under is four levels, four uh, castes, and the Christian is the bottom caste. Then is the Israelite, then the Jew, then the Hebrew, and above that is the fifth level, the uh, Telestoi, the perf perfected masters. Hmm. And basically that, that corresponds to the illuminated ones, you see. Right. So, right. But, but as y you will know what y you have to feed your body, your temple, because that's your temple, at the right time, you'll be directed because you're the one directing the show um, in the first place from the higher causal planes. And so you will know when you have to stop tasting blood. The other thing that will help... Um, uh, there's chanting. There's also um, 
physical yoga, you know, moving your body, stretching it, um, allowing the energy to get unblocked. Um, sunbathing, you need, you need so much sunlight directly on the body, naked outside in the sun, perhaps put some coconut oil on your mm-hmm. body or some apple cider vinegar. I've heard about that, uh, the usefulness of that. I've heard a lot of people talking about it, and it's kind of interesting because, of course, it's illegal to be naked. And with our nine to five jobs that they've got us in, a lot of us can't get outside for that period of time. It's funny how they take all the sunlight hours and put us in these little cubicles during our day as debt slaves, and we don't get those benefits that are probably very important to human development. Yeah, look, you'll get it. The sun's rays penetrate through everything, so you will get it, but you'll get less of it, Um, and it'll be slower. They're slowing down our ascension. That's basically what's going on. They do it through diet. They do it through fear. They do it through intimidation, and later on, we'll get through the sovereignty part where they do it through the legal name, um, and they do it through uh, all the beasts of revelation. The legal name, for instance, is the, um, the false idol that we bow down to. Um, the beast of revelation is corporatism, corpse, body. The beast has a body. Mm-hmm. The false prophet is the Vatican, the divining serpent, the false prophet, and the harlot is maritime, maritime law or the Inquisition because the harlot sits on many waters. So we're going we're gonna to look at the four aspects of uh, Babylon the Great and how we've been entwined and how we get out of Babylon the Great. So, mm-hmm. But it starts with the legal name. That's where it all starts. Anyway, um, this is, these are the sort of things that we need to do to ascend. They're, they're slowing down the ascension. It will take place despite the vaccines filled with, um, you know, um, uh, thimerosal mercury based preservatives, um, sodium uh, fluoride, which is actually a toxic um, fertilizer industry uh, byproduct that they're putting into our waters. Right. It should be um, calcium fluoride. Calcium fluoride is one of the 12 cell salts, the uh, Schussler cell salts, that um, here again the number 12 comes into all things. Your, um, your uh, body ashes, once cremated, the body consists of um, 12 salts. And they are potassium phosphate for the sign of Aries, sodium chloride for the sign of Taurus, potassium chloride for Gemini. And these are all in a row. These are the first, second, third sign and all in a row uh, along the ecliptic. Um, Cancer is um, calcium fluoride. And so this is what they should be putting in the water. And, but sodium, uh, uh, silco fluoride, this is, a, this is a toxin. This is totally detrimental to the human health. Right. And so um, this is the sort of stuff that, um, that, that they're doing to slow down the ascension. But, but then again, it will not be thwarted. Do you think that chemtrails play a role in that process, either by blocking sunlight or something? I mean, because obviously people talk about them being weather modification, but I'm curious if they have a role in slowing down that spiritual process as well. Yes. Yes, it does. The stuff they put in that beryllium, radium, um, blood plasma, fibers, toxic fibers, aluminium, uh, all these pollutants in the name of science, very clever of them. (laughs) Um, But you see, it at the same time, though, all the works that they that they put in place, they all have side effects that are actually beneficial. And so you might think it's crazy to think that chemtrails could have um, a beneficial side, but um, ultimately they, they must have. And um, who knows? It could be that some of those toxic elements might have high vibrating, very beneficial elements that are actually uh, being amplified so that the ascension happens quicker for some because you will notice that um, all of your philosophical and mystical friends that you interview and you do some um, some great interviews um, oh, and and by the way Macca um, wants to say uh, thank you loves you loves your show wow. and um, he always sends me the links um, so I'm listening to you too uh, a lot great well thanks Macca and I think we did a show back a couple of years ago too didn't we yeah we did <laughs> okay, so um, so there will always be good coming from this, brother. There is good and evil in this duality, in unity world that we live in. But ultimately, the highest prototype of this is good. Good is one. And in the Neoplatonists reminded us that that good is what people call God. Mm-hmm. Allah is God, all is good. It's the principle of good. 
which, um, which precedes the principle of beauty. And beauty is Bel, the god Bel, the beautiful, the Bel, you know, um, uh, we say Bella in Italiano, you know, or Bello. It's Baal, it's, it's the beautiful one. And so the sun in the heavens, when we look at the sun and we do our solar gazing, we are looking at the body of the sun made of hydrogen and helium or anything that vibrates because it's, it's, it actually has all the elements. There's carbon in the sun, there's sulfur, there's all, all the elements are there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it has a body. It has a psychic body, mind and emotion and sense, and it has a spiritual power source. And so the spirit is the father. The son is the soul. If you have seen the son, you have seen the father. No one goes to the Father except through me, the Son. I am the life and the truth and the way. So what it's teaching us is is this, that we will go through three basic fundamental levels to climb that ladder and ascend and go back to our promised land, heaven. Mm -hmm. And um, we go back to the rest of God, God's Sabbath. And how we do that is we go from sense, uh, sorry, through um, opinion, through sense, Knowledge, understanding, wisdom, intuition, theurgy, and then finally illumination where we relinquish the conditioned mind, which is a uh, condition, and we, uh, we go into the state of being. We become uh, God. We don't become gods. We become God because we are God, and, and, that, and that God is atom, and we are all atoms. We have an anatomy. Hence, we are all Tommy. When you stand erect with your feet together and your arms outstretched horizontally, you are in the shape of the tomb, Tommy, the T, the letter T, the cross we must all bear. Mm -hmm. We come from a womb and we end up in a tomb, said Plato, from Sema to Soma, or sorry, from Soma to Sema, from womb to tomb. And so when the scriptures say that the dead shall rise, that is the dead who are living in the dead corporate status, in the dead corporate condition of the legal name. So we're going to get to that. Right. But what's most important is that we understand that as the sun raises up molecules of water and they um, evaporate and as it draws up with its drawing power, it does the same with souls. This is the, this is Jesus. The, uh, Jesus, the Savior, the the soul portion of the Son, because the Christ is the spiritual portion of the Son. Christ and Jesus are two different things, and yet they are one. This is why the Freemasons never say Jesus Christ; they always say Christ Jesus when they do their um, secret Masonic knock. Tum titi titi tum tum titi tum tum on your door. You'll notice the atomic knock. Tum 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 as a percussionist plays on his tom toms and tambourines. We all have this atomic sounding universe. And so what they do is the Freemasons is they don't tell you that this uh, secret Tommy knock is um, what they then say the secret word is Christ Jesus. Because Christ is Krishna, Mm. the one, the universal soul, the universal prototype, the universal archetype, the one, the monad, the being, the source and cause of all other onenesses, unities, you know, we are units, unit is an atomic word, unit comes from atom, you see, I-T-N, U-T-N, and so all is atun, Akhenaten said it was Aton. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses tell you that it's the Tetragrammaton, the four letters. Those four letters are Jiva, Jehovah, Jiva, G-I-V-A, two syllables, four words, the Tetragrammaton. And Jiva gives you Jehovah, or you can say it as we say our word give, G-I-V-E. Or J I V E, Jiv, the giver of life, the giver of life. This is the Masonic G. Mm. It, yeah, it's the giver of life. He is the good, the archetype of good. That's why he sits under the Masonic arch. He is the archetype. 
And so what it's teaching you is that all things have their arcs, their archetypes. And as we go through the arcs of consciousness and ascend our consciousness, you know, and stop acting like swine and rabbits and chickens and chattel and sheeple and sacrificial goats, hmm. and we become the hero. In the Greek philosophical system, the fifth level from animal through mineral through plant through human is the next, which corresponds with the uh, Jewish in the Kabbalistic system, the Jew or the hero. See, again, the hero is not a hero as um, there are three kinds of heroes in the um, the legend of the cave of the nymphs, according to Plato, when um, – when Macrobius did a, um, a, di a you know a uh, commentary on the cave of the nymph nymphs, he explained exactly what uh, Pythagoras and Plato were on about. We are the soul. The spirits come from the Milky Way. They uh, then go through the seven levels, the seven doors, or the seven heavens of you know the Quran and Allah that he climbed in his night flight to heaven. And you go down the seven planetary bodies, and they are in this order. Um, according to their revolutions, Saturn is the first one because he is the old man. He takes 30 years to do a revolution. And so he is the first ring. And then Jupiter's 12-year orbit, that's the second ring. And then Mars is a two-year orbit, that's the third ring. Then the sun is the um, one-year, 365-day uh, orbit, that's the middle one, the middle rung. And then Venus, 228 days, she is the uh, fifth. Then Mercury, uh, 188, if I'm not wrong, he is the sixth. Then the moon, she does a 30-day orbit and she is the last ring. So souls, that makes up the compound of the soul. The soul is made up by those seven planets, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. <laughs> And so, and the, and the eighth orb is the um, the Earth. Er, you see, Er is the eighth sound. Remember, there's seven vowels for the lost name of God, which is Aum. Well, the diphthong Er, and it's the same sound that you get in burn, turn, whirl, word, worlds. You see, the word of God. Ether becomes Ertha. Ether and Ertha are the same octave or different, the same substance, different octaves. That's interesting. Seven octaves, seven orbs. And Saturn being first, is that why we see so much Saturnian symbolism coming from the elite in their various affairs? Yeah, well, we're going to get to that because um, Saturn is Kronos. Kronos is the crown, as all the philosophers have ever said. So Saturn is the one who wears the crown which resembles the rings of Saturn and this is why when you're born in a hospital and you you um, consign your um, child's sole of his foot onto a piece of paper which says specifically this is crown copyright um, you are selling your soul to the devil at that very moment and mm. uh, and the legal name then takes on a corporate beast like entity and by doing obeisance and bowing down to this false idol, we have been trapped in a commercial system of Babylon the Great. So we'll get back, we'll get to that crown and Kronos. See, this is why the administers of the bar, who are the prostitutors or prosecutors of mm -hmm. the crown that resides in Rome, who are the bar, that's why these prostitutes are the prostitutes for the pimps in Rome. We live in a pimpocracy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain who the beast with seven heads is and the, um, the corporate owners of this um, corporatism that uh, controls the world through the Vatican and the crown at the Vatican and the crown in London and the crown in uh, District of mm -hmm. Columbia. So we're going to do that. And, um, but first, it's very important to understand how we got, came down this ladder, ladder as Nephilim and fellas and we climb – back the other way as Elohim and heroes. Okay. A hero, yeah, a hero is a philosophical hero. There are three kinds of heroes in the cave of the nymph, um, uh, according to um, your, your uh, philosophers. So there's the Jupiter Jupiterian at the top, 
Um, they save themselves and others through their works, through their deeds. They put people on the straight and narrow. Then you have your Neptunian psychic kind of heroes, which are your, you know, your um, Ulysses. He couldn't sa save his friends <clears throat> at all. They perished, but he got home to Penelope on his own and saved his own backside. So he is a Neptunian. You see, Neptune, the god of the waters, tormented him for 10 complete cyclical years, but eventually he did escape uh, Neptune, the second um, hero. And the bottom hero is the Plutonian hero, <clears throat> the um, hero of sense, of opinion. And these would be, you know, your war generals and these type that go and become heroes when they go off to fight for their nations and countries and and they believe they are doing a service for humanity and you know they're not cowards and they don't uh, they run into the line of battle and you know and your sports heroes these also are heroes and we all are heroes but there's different qualities of heroes so eventually we will all become jupiterian heroes heroes of spiritual nature who save themselves and through their good deeds and and words are actually saving others. And so when we um, chant these uh, seven letters and then finally the eighth let, um, uh, sound, which is er, for the word of God, that er sound, which whirls and burns and turns as toroidal fields do and create whirling worlds. You see, to go from word, the word of God, to the word world, you just have to add an L, the 12th letter of the alphabet, mm -hmm. L. 12 is God, the mind of God, L, Elohim, you see? Mm -hmm. So the letter L is uh, related to both 7 and 12. Elohim, there are seven Elohim, but the letter uh, L, Lamed, is actually the 12. So it's also mind of God. Mind is 12, body is 7. And so... What we are doing, you see, is we are also um, toroidal fields. That's why we have a torso, and that's why we have an, a core, which is a heart. A heart is a cur or a um, cardiac core. Just as an apple has an apple core, our hearts are our apple cores, you see. Mm -hmm. And what an apple is, is, is Apollo. Apollo is the god of toroidal fields. So if you were to a, able to, if you were synesthetic, you would be able to see your body. You would see that it was a beautiful body of light and you would see a toroidal field. Its core is your heart and it enters through the uh, fontanelle at the top of your head and um, releases through the bottom chakra and it just twirls. So you've got this whirling, twirling, burning, turning word that makes the earth, which is the er sound. And all of these sounds are very, very powerful archetypes. The vowels are very powerful creative forces. <clears throat> and um, as Manly P. Hall explains in his beautiful astrotheological um, presentations, free on, on the internet, when the universe is uh, created, when Brahma makes his uh, aspiration, in breath and out breath, seven sons are born. And from those seven sons, those are seven archetypes, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon, in that order, always, the seven colors of the rainbow, violet is Saturn, indigo is Jupiter, um, blue is Mars, green is the Sun, um, yellow is Venus, orange is Mercury, and red is the moon, and vice versa. You can put Saturn at the bottom and, and the moon at the top. You can play around with this. But those archetypes, those seven colors, um, and in particular red and blue, and hence this is why your police cars have red and blue on the top because these are the two creative um, colors of creation. They create a scenario. They create a contract with those two colors. Red is fire. Water is blue. Red is alarming. Water is blue is calming. Red comes from the proton. Blue comes from the electron. So the proton is prana 
and the electron is luminescence. Red, ra, proton, blue, el 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 electron. Hmm. And so the letter R is the um, is what they call the rhotic liquid consonant. And the letter L is the lateral liquid consonant. And these two are the two halves of creation. The letter R is red, ra, radiation and vibration. The letter L is blue, luminescence, water. And these two colors produce all of the effects, ra and bell. You know, um, you could say in the Hindu system, uh, jiva is the spirit, the spiritual sun, prana. And so in, in uh, uh, atomic um, the, um, physics, you would call that the neutron. So inside of atom, there is a, a neutron, a proton, and an electron. And, you know, in uh, Hebrew theology, this is Israel, Isis, Ra, and El. Mm. The letter Isis is is, being, white light, which produces two colors, two suns, two bodies, mind, the proton, red, the color red, mental force, married with blue, the emotional feminine side with the emotions we experience with the mind we learn and so these two are the two polarities of creative force and we have these bodies we have these powers and archetypes in us and they all go back to atom and the neutron the proton and the electron the color white neutral the color red positive Fire, masculine, radiance, everything radiates and vibrates. Vibra. Vibra is uh, another word for abra, abracadabra. I create through sound. Abrasion, abra, abrasion. Everything is abrasion. And it all starts with the proton. Hmm. Because, because this is our theology. This is what syncretism does. It merges theology with Whatever, you know, all yeah. of the sciences, you know. And and we have this knowledge. We, we all know this. We all know syncretism. We all are syncretists. Syncretism will be and is the uh, true saviour of diversity and um, separation that has gone on for too long. Syncretism is the science that the Vatican has persecuted for since Hypatia and the destruction of the Alexandrian Library and since uh, Justinian... Um, she closed down the closed down the Neoplatonic uh, schools in uh, 527 um, Common Era. So, you know, this is very sad. It's a sad chapter, but we all we all know this. And through the witch hunts, we were persecuted through the Dark Ages, and they tried to snuff it out. But we all know syncretism. We all know that what's going to save the world from all of this division is syncretism, because syncretism is neutral. Syncretism explains the world through the Quran, through the Bible, through the Bhagavad Gita. Syncretism loves and, and embraces and has temperance and forbearance for all the philosophies and all the ways and all the sciences. They can all be explained and united through syncretism. And this is why Marsilio Ficino in the Renaissance days, he went down to Rome with 900 theses of syncretism. I have his book. It's called Syncretism in the West. You can get it. You can get it through um, through Amazon. It's only thirty bucks, and you can see all of his nine hundred theses, thirty years before Martin Luther's ninety theses, which were Protestant um, corporate um, inferior theses, totally, totally corporate, which started a new Protestant um, corporate structure for the world. Whereas Marsilio Ficino, he was a Neoplatonist. He was a syncretist. He was an astrotheologer. He was all of those things, and he went down to Rome, and of course they persecuted him. He was going to debate with the uh, Apostolic Senate in Rome, the popes, and the, and so he started putting posters and billboards all around Rome saying syncretism is back and it's here to stay. And so he he was um, they poisoned him eventually back in Florence, where the um, where the Medici's were were funding syncretism. Um, and um, sorry, I'm speaking about uh, Pico, not Marsilio. Marsilio stayed in Florence. Um, 
his student, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, he's the one who uh, went down to Rome to try and save the world. This is 100 years before Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake for teaching syncretism in the year 1600. Mm. Unfortunately, he didn't get enough time to convert uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, and Queen Elizabeth was listening to Giordano Bruno and she was going to make uh, England a very Protestant kind of hermetic uh, neoplatonist country um, but of course uh, that didn't happen because the wrong people were speaking to Queen Elizabeth I and uh, Giordano Bruno was um, betrayed he was um, for seven years prosecuted by the um, the crown old man time Satan the devil at the Vatican the false prophet and um, put to death and so I've, I've experienced this kind of witch hunt in uh, my country and from um, all around the world, really. people, uh, Some people who are still in the opinion and sense uh, realms of consciousness would happily condemn me to the uh, most deepest parts of the fiery hell hmm. with Satan, you know, because of teaching the, um, the true science. Right. Yeah, they choose to have their separate Baptist or Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or whatever it is, um, illusion, rather than the unity of syncretism. So I have, I have uh, three key words that, um, that will always remain with me in my philosophical and mystical um, journey as I grow myself, and they will be syncretism, the ecliptic, and the word atom. Um, with these these things, you can know all things, and you will know all things, because mm. syncretism is um, neutrally uniting all things. The ecliptic is the teacher, and atom is the ecliptic. The ecliptic is atom. For instance, today is um, the 3rd of July, the Feast of St. Thomas Day. Why is... A day before 4th of July, which is perihelion day, the day the sun is closest to the earth, um, and the sun's only about 3,000 miles high up in the sky, and so we've got a flat projector screen that the sun produces called earth inside a sphere. The sun is doing circles above the earth uh, about 3,000 miles away, but it is closer on July 4th, perihelion day, than it is on its opposite 4th of January, apohelion day. And so why is the 3rd of July called Feast of St. Thomas, Tammuz, right in the middle of the sign of cancer? which is in the Jewish system called the month of Tammuz. So you've got the Feast of St. Tammuz. In the month of Tammuz, Cancer, at the Tropic of Cancer. Let's uh, have a look at that one. We, uh, that's, to, that's today. But um, the ecliptic is the wave. The ecliptic is the path of the sun from March the 21st, the equinox, to the Tropic of Cancer, June the 21st, the solstice, to... The equator once more, 23rd of uh, September, the autumnal equinox, Judgment Day, 23rd of September. Remember, 23, you can look all this up on the internet. 23 is a very powerful number in secret societies because it's Atonement Day. It's the equinox of autumn. Mm. And then as the sun departs from that equilibrium, Judgment Day in Libra, the scales of judgment, Tishri, of the Jews, then it goes to the Tropic of Capricorn. And that's what the sun's doing all year round. It's going from the goat, climbing the mountain as it waxes to the Tropic of Cancer, and then the sidewards walking animal called the crab begins to backwards slide all the way down. Hence, the Muslims have Ramadan, one month of mourning in Cancer, month of Tammuz, because now a sad thing is happening. The sun is waning, you see. Mm -hmm. And the Jews, they go off and they have their fasting and mourning. And they say the month of Tammuz is evil. It's cruel. It's merciless. And the Lord Moses apparently um, broke the two stone tablets. They were broken in two, of course, because when the sun reaches uh, the Tropic of Cancer, it divides the year in two. It's been waxing for six months. Now it's going to be waning. So that's the two stone tablets of the... the um, Moses. Hmm. And so it's the ecliptic. As Walter Russell the Great said, the secret of creation lies in the wave. 
Well, we all know that the wave, the wave field, the wave has a wave amplitude. Well, that's Cancer and Capricorn, the solstices. And we know that the wave starts at, uh, at sine and yeah, cosine would be the tropics where, the, you know, the Cancer and Capricorn, whereas Aries and Libra at the equinoxes, 21st of March, 23rd of September, at one month day, atonement day, um, these are the two balancing sine wave um, starting points. So you've got sine and cosine. You see, when Eve ate of the apple, Eve is the Ave wave, Ave Maria. Eve, she eats the, um, the, the fruit and she has a co-sinner with her. She gives Adam, Adam, the ecliptic, some of her fruit and says, you taste it with me. So sine and cosine are basically the sine wave. And as uh, Walter Russell said, the secret of creation is in the wave and the wave that we call the year is the ecliptic. And the ecliptic teaches all things. And what I'm going to uh, do after I release um, Atomic Language and Atomic Theology presentation, 250 PowerPoint um, slides, pages of the most penetrable and deepest research that you will ever find in probably in history Damn. about our atom atomic theology and atomic. I've already released tens of um, uh, radio shows and presentations called Atom and the Ecliptic online for free. Um, so, but the second one I will release will be called The Holy Days and the Ecliptic. And I'll start at March the 21st and show all of the holidays, you know, mm -hmm. the birthday of Sri Rama on April 15, Ramadan, Christmas, Easter. I'll show them all on the ecliptic and show how they all co coincide and correspond with the seasons on the ecliptic. All of your festivities like Easter, they all correspond with the spring month, spring, spra. Pra, prana, ra, coming into life, the blossoms. Then all of your Ramadans and all of your, you know, 6th of August Assumption Day or Transfiguration Day that are related to um, the summer months. Then you've got Atonement and Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah of the Jews in Tishri. That's all your autumnal festivities. And then your Christmas is your winter. And I will show how, because obviously when I release um, Atomic Language, there will be um, academic types which will need more proofs. They will not be satisfied. Right. Many will be. Many w will be thoroughly, thoroughly satisfied that we have one language. It's atomic. Hence, we have etymology, atomology, the science of words, atom, etymology. And so what I will do is then release that one and then uh, subsequent 20 other already prepared fully developed presentations, which I actually, um, I did a few of these presentations on my uh, 2003 uh, Europe tour, but unfortunately no one has put them online. The only uh, presentations I did out of these 22 that are online, the Glastonbury Zodiac and Syncretism uh, presentations and the uh, Stonehenge one that I did about um, the sun and how... Um, the sun in history, I called that one. So, and um, you'll also see online another one um, about um, ascension, which is another presentation I've got about the holy science, which I did in Amsterdam. So, if you punch those words in uh, YouTube together with my name, um, you can get a glimpse of the uh, PowerPoint presentations that I'm, I'm doing. Unfortunately, I did uh, 14 presentations in the UK alone, Manchester. Um, Birmingham, London, I went everywhere and uh, 12 of those are probably lost forever. But mm. that's why I'm going to release them now, um, hopefully in the signs of Cancer and Leo. Cancer is where my north node is and Leo is my ascendant. So these are my two, um, my two good months along the ecliptic. I always have great you know, June, July, August, always, all my life, as I've noticed. I'm kind of curious, actually, because I've been looking into so much of your work and the astrology side of things. 
How much control and free will do we really have over our lives and emotions and tendencies when so much of what seems to make up our lives here is decided by the stars? If we remain in ignorance, we are totally 100% governed and controlled by that destiny and that fate, that fatalism. Once you know your astrological chart and you know the science of the word of God, astro theologia or astrologia, logia is logos, the word, and astro is, well, light and God is light, last time I checked, hmm. hence astrology is the science of light. So if you learn your natal chart and the propens propensities and dynamics that are in your chart, for instance, uh, you know what your ascendant is, you know what your sign, you know, for instance, my son is in Aries, 24th of March, my moon is in Pisces. Funny, my birthday is the 25th of March. <laughs> oh, holy hallelujah. Very close. Yeah, the first deacon of March is uh, ruled by uh, Mars, so we are very martial. The first, the, the March portion of Aries, the April portion is ruled by um, yes, the sun, the middle deacon, and then Jupiter is the um, the third deacon. So... We are very martial. We're good fighters. We're good action leaders. We're like a good, stubborn, combative ram. <laughs> but um, if you learn these, your natal chart, then you are getting a glimpse of your defects and your strengths, your dynamics, your propensities. And so like a mechanic that will point out that that noise in your motor, that's not a pretty noise. That's the... Um, you know, that's your camshaft, that's your cam belt, and that's, that's only got about 100 or 200 uh, miles of life in it, and you better get that fixed. While you were thinking, wow, I love the sound of that ticka 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 noise in my motor. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the foolish one will uh, turn his uh, radio up when he hears some kind of a click clickety clackety noise in his motor, so he drowns out the... Um, you know, the uh, the symptoms, and so there's no more symptoms left. You see, it's a bit like um, what an aspirin does. You put, you take an aspirin so that your headache goes away because now your stomach is bleeding <laughs> and you're going to be bleeding potentially to death. So now you have got a different problem. You forget about your headache. The aspirin works. Yeah. And uh, it takes you to uh, another problem. Now you've got ulcers and holes in your stomach and um, reflux and gas problems and all sorts of intestinal woes because you've taken some prescribed drugs. <laughs> Funny about that. Right. Yeah, so um, that's syncretism, brother. I know I'm going pretty fast, but I am inspired today. I was very inspired by the 3rd of July and by what I'm going to share with you. And I know that you're very, very open-minded um, kind of guy and I know that if you don't get all these things that I'm saying the first time around you can listen back to the recordings and you will get it <laughs> you definitely will get it sooner or later because this is the science of ascension the science of light and the science of um, unity oneness bringing all things back to the one when all are one and one are all you know, you know the song stay away to heaven hey eh? when uh, as we wind on down the road, our shadow is taller than our soul. There walks a lady we all know who shines white light and wants to show how everything still turns to gold. Yes, if you transmute lead, that is, you will. You know, she's reminding us that uh, as we walk on that path, that if we buy our stairway to heaven and we go up those ladders, the ladder of Jacob, we will say, as Jacob did one day when he said, um, I've seen God face to face and I shall call this place pineal, pineal gland. Mm. So you will arrive and you will activate and um, crystallize or, you know, crystify your pineal gland. <laughs> uh, decalcify it and it will, it will crystallize. It will harden up and it will become a rock, a diamond, a crystal, and it will um, emanate like a tongue of fire above your head. You will have a halo. You will have an energy that people will see in your eyes that your soul is good, it's pure, and you are serving the good. You are serving God. You are serving your, your, your higher yourself for the sake of your being and the sake of humanity. Can't wait. Well, you're doing it. You're doing it now. You are a hero. You, you, are, you are pointing people to you know, great researchers on your show. You're giving them a chance to speak and get onto the airwaves and save many, many, many souls. You don't need to be specifically aware of all of these units of salvation that you are putting out, but you are reaching the hearts of people and changing them. You know, they will, 
get many aha moments themselves and remember, you know, the remember the call. As uh, Ulysses remembered Penelope, you know, um, she was fighting off all these suitors. Well, the suitors are worldly wisdom, you see. Mm-hmm. And and so when we are tempted by the siren and Ulysses tied himself to that mast so that he wouldn't be seduced by the lower sirens and he would be called by the higher sirens to go back. So when he came back to his land, he didn't recognize it anymore because he was returning. It wasn't the first time he was there. But the reason why he didn't recognize and um, Penelope didn't recognize him, he knew her, he recognized her. But um the wisdom, Sophia, Penelope, um, you know, she uh, she needed proof. So, of course, he pulled out his bow and arrow and, and then she realized because he had perfected his, um, his lower um, instincts, instincts and he has returned now like the prodigal son returns to his father. And um, he hears that voice and he pierces the third eye with his arrow and he awakens and returns and he is restored and the suitors must flee. In fact, he kills all the suitors because they are worldly wisdom. They represent a different kind of wisdom. Um, You know, it's sort of a a lower philosophical kind. You see, Mm -hmm. um, Plato, when, when he went to his third stage, when he went from the philosopher to the mystic, of course, we don't have any of his mystical works, unfortunately, but... That's when he separated with Aristotle. Aristotle could not follow him. And Plato went to southern Italy and died there, and um, where Pythagoras also died, and all the other great uh, philosophers down in Calabria, where I come from. Hmm. And, of course, um, Aristotle went off and started the uh, peripatetic school uh, um, of the wandering philosophers, you know, uh, philosophizing and the the, the sophists. There was a school that sort of went went inferior sophists. The, the original sophists were dealing in wisdom for the sake of wisdom, for the sake of bettering one's soul. Whereas the late, latter sophists, um, you know, sophistry, they become what the word sophistry um, signifies, and you know, they commercialized it, and so. It's an inferior sort of a philosophical way, but we will merge the philosopher with the mystic. That is our destiny. We're all destined. So going back to your your question about the stars and, you know, um, you feel rather uncomfortable about having all of these electrical dynamics in your body. Well, some people are born with no arms. Some people are born with no eyes. Some people are born with a lot of courage. Some lack courage. Yeah. Others achieve. Others have sicknesses and, and nasty accidents and misfortunes in marriage. This is all in the chart. I can find all of this in the chart and more. And so once one knows this, then like the mechanic who tells you, you know, that uh, tap it noise, uh, that's not a very good noise, then what do you do? Well, do you turn the radio up or do you now consciously affect a solution you know do you repair the car and and go and go forward and this is what astrology does it shows you the crystalline nature of your soul hmm. and your intellectual nature and your physical nature it shows whether you will have a long physical life or a short one wow yeah i guess the knowledge is power why not know about it true and the greatest knowledge you can have is the knowledge of what's on your ecliptic well said yeah wow man I guess we should probably start wrapping this up, but we should do this again for sure. There's a lot more depth to this material. I'd love to talk more about the composition of our reality that just seems so far off from what we're taught that it's even hard to conceptualize. And it's just a whole big ball of wax, man. And I love talking about it, but I guess we should kind of call it in with that. I mean, you've provided quite a bit of crown control kryptonite here. I guess, would you like to remind the people about your website and where they can get your lectures and anything else you have on the horizon? Uh, website is Universal Truth School, one word. That's it, universaltruthschool.com. And there I have lots of videos you can watch. It connects you up to... Um, my video channel on YouTube, and I've also got, for those who want hard copies, I've got DVDs there too available. I've got uh, six syncretism graphics. Um, these are the most inclusive type of syncretism graphics on astrology and all of um, esoteric wisdom that you can possibly get. You've got 
the whole science just in graphics and uh, they you you can receive those digitally and and then you can turn those into wall posters should you want to because they've got enough pi- uh, pixelation there that's my website um, I've also got a lot of syncretism shows on um, a radio channel that I do a lot of work on astrotheologyradio.com and you can listen to a lot of this type of information very cool well I have had a great time, man. Definitely enlightening stuff. Very dense, and uh, I'm going to have to listen a couple of times, but uh, I pretty much just wanted to stay out of your way because it's so much to get out, and I'm, I'm glad that we did. I think you did a great, great job breaking that down. So thanks again for being here, and take care of yourself out there, man. Thanks, brother. You too. Catch you next time. Take care. And boom goes the dynamite, people. Santo Bonacci, Syncretism, Ascension, Atomic Language, and Triple Crown Control. I liked it. Santo had a lot of his latest research he wanted to get out. I'm humbled that he chose THC, and I think some of these components really jive with some of the Hattiebov research we've been talking about with Crow. The atomic language material, to me, sort of jives with the idea of a holographic universe dictated by octaves and vibration and resonance. The idea that sound and words have a deeper meaning and maybe our language has been refined to avoid certain tones and sounds that might reveal some of this importance. I don't know. seems to be a major component of the scientific quarantine. And we didn't get too much into the controllers and the legal mechanisms they use until the second hour because there's just so much to get out about those earlier topics and atomic language and ascension. And in the Plus show, I was able to follow up with more questions I had about some of these things Santo is so clued in on. Astrology, maritime and contract law, and the stratification of control there. The power and usefulness of entheogens. He also talked about the Khazarian and Roman families marrying together, the Jesuits with the Freemasons in a partnership that seems to have been working together ever since. We also discussed the firmament and the flat earth idea and the concept that we're in a shell and how the flat earth theory actually works better with astrology, according to Santo. Really fascinating stuff. I wasn't aware that he was in the camp that we live on a flat plane. But we got into how he confirmed it for himself during an international flight. And he throws out so much great material that sometimes I miss things the first time around. And I was going back over this interview and he actually did drop it in the first hour. I only missed it. He said, we live in a sphere rather than on a sphere. And I just didn't think about the implications of that statement. I do think it's really interesting to see so many people coming to this kind of conclusion. It seems to be growing more every day. In the Plus Show, I liked how he put it in that we've got a flat screen projector on which the sun produces the image called Earth inside a sphere. I mean, (laughs) I love it. But it's all awesome stuff. Atomic language, ascension, syncretism. I like how Santo pulls a lot of seemingly different things in to show that they're really all the same. I think that's a great approach. Also, he has a show starting on American Freedom Radio and online radio network, and they've also just started playing THC on Saturday nights, which I'm grateful for too. I think American Freedom Radio and Art Bell's Dark Matter are the two biggest alternative internet radio networks. Happy to be on them both. Of course, THC is always available on demand whenever you see fit, just by subscribing to the RSS feed or going to thehiresidechats.com, but you know these things. Also, as this is the fourth show of the month, we got a money bomb coming up. I'm going to be giving half the donations back to a random listener. I'm probably going to be picking someone on Friday morning. So keep an eye on those inboxes. Thanks so much for listening. I think this next show I just recorded is really going to blow some minds. I can't wait to get it out. But until then, that's it for me. I've done my part. Your move, Triple Crown Controllers, Sovereignty Stiflers, and Consciousness Captors. Your freaking move. Have a drink and a smoke. Listen to the cast We shine a shiny spotlight Put criminals on blast The pinstripe men of mourning And families of finance DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild The kids don't stand a chance The kids don't The kids don't stand The kids don't stand a chance I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. We're looking for the answers. 
to questions never asked. So we come to the Cartwood for the higher side chats. The pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. We try to get a glance. We're working on the numbers. Resistance must advance. The pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't. The kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. <laughs>